Captain Soldier continues on. Chapter 14. The division had been routed several times. We're at chapter 14, page 349. The division had been routed several times and has sustained serious losses. Units believed to be intact were often borrowed from us and uh, sent to bolster some faltering position. When they arrived, they would be found short by about two-thirds of their strength. There was nothing to be done about it. Our own group was enjoying a much-needed spell of relative calm. Our existence would have been almost idyllic except for the depressing and infuriating quality of barracks life. The exercises were given as if we were green troops in for basic training brought us close to open revolt. We had moved 250 miles to a position in Poland, far from the front. Our camp was on the banks of the Dniester, some 50 miles from Lvov, in the foothills of the Carpathians. The river is quite narrow at this point, and its waters, when we arrived, were swift and tumultuous, running through a network of small islands loaded with snow and ice. On any wide stretch, the river was frozen to a considerable depth, and the current ran beneath the ice, giving off a strange muffled noise. Our view was magnificent. A pale blue sky and a horizon marked by snow peaks against which we could watch flights of eagles. For two months, we enjoyed the agreeable change from the black and gray of a Ukrainian winter to the sportive landscape of Easter Galicia. Galician snows were also very heavy, and the cold was severe, but we slept in clean, heated barracks. Although an exaggerated sense of economy uh, kept the heat at some 50 degrees or so, this at least enabled us to be fully alert when we were awake. Our camp was huge and organized with all the Prussian rigor of an army on the eve of battle. About 150 wooden buildings without floors had been built in blocks, carrying numbers and letters. Nearby in the snow-covered woods we could see uh, a large stone building, which must have been part of the village beside the camp, which housed our secretariat and principal officer. All our material had been repainted and overhauled. In these conditions of order and apparent abundance, none of us dreamed that Germany had reached the limit of its capacities. After the chaos at the front, the atmosphere uh, of efficient organization with it required that every move be registered in writing, made us feel like wild beasts suddenly caged. The camp was built around a large central square for reviews and drills in which young recruits were instructed in the art of manipulating arms, so useful in parades and so useless at the front. The young recruits seemed to enjoy these exercises. Others like Hals and me were seeing ourselves as we had been a year and a half ago, back in Poland, where we had handled explosives for the first time. The memory of those days seemed at least 10 years old. One ages quickly in wartime. Our world-weary attitude did not escape the attention of the young recruits, who responded by holding themselves even more stiffly, as if to show us that the war was now their affair. This healthy enthusiasm of schoolboys suddenly transformed into soldiers was destined to weaken somewhat after a few nights in the mud and the shock of seeing a field hospital for the first time. We had been through all that, they would soon learn that war does not always create the same exaltation as the intoxicating explosion of the plaster grenades in the war games of training camp. The Fuhrer, who was now scraping the bottom of the barrel, had been forced to send his arrogant police off to war. These elderly new recruits were having a hard time of it. The sight of policemen scraping through the mud on their bellies delighted us enough so that we almost forgot our sufferings. Police officers whose competence in war was limited handed over their men to officers of the Fairbacht, who put them through the works. This spectacle, which gave us so much pleasure, was hard on the eager young recruits, directly exposed to the bad humor of those bastards who did everything they could to keep the younger men in a state of inferiority. 
For us, life was also very far from perfect. Before settling into our new quarters, there had been a long and difficult journey. We had begun by tramping more than 30 miles on bad Russian roads, deeply rutted and coated with ice. Then we were loaded onto trucks and driven as far as Mogilev, an oriental-looking town, where we boarded two trains, both in very bad condition, for the remainder of the journey along the Bessarabian frontier to Lvov in Poland. From Lvov, trucks had brought us to the camp where we had stumbled out, exhausted and filthy, under the suspicious gaze of polished, healthy officer instructors. We were allowed 48 hours to rest before our clothes and equipment had to be in perfect order. At our first inspection, the condition of our uniforms shocked the inspectors, although we had brushed and beaten them as hard as we could. They completely lost their original color and appearance. Gray-green had become greenish piss yellow, decorated by tears and holes and reddish-brown burns. Our worn and crumpled boots had lost their black finish, and many were without heels or laces. We looked like a bunch of tramps, and the inspectors were ready to jump at the slightest sign of negligence. These evident traces of the battlefield struck them like slaps in the face, to which there was no answer. These fops should, in fact, have been honoring us. They knew it, too, and the knowledge irritated them. They persisted in picking on details to try to save face. A short way off, sections of police and students in camouflage uniforms were marching to their daily sweat baths, singing gaily in the dry, cold air, which had brought out the color in their cheeks. Da Stone Eiferde Feld ein Mats Tirolander. Whatever the hell that means. However, instead of the Alps, the Carpathians witnessed their compulsory gaiety. The instructors, intent on inspection, were insensible to the poetry of the scene. One of them stopped short in front of a gefreiter whose coat ended in a fringe as full of holes as a piece of Alison lace. At that, the, the Stabsfeldwebel could unload a little rage in front of his sarcastic audience. Our heads turned slightly, scarcely noticeable to the right, toward the fellow accused of negligence. We rolled our eyes as far as we could, trying to see who was getting it. Name and number, shouted the Stabs, stiffening his neck. Even if we couldn't see anything, we could hear it. Frosch, Herr Stabsfeldwebel. The accused shouted, adding the number which each of us was supposed to know by heart. Frosh! The name stirred an echo in my memory. Frosh! Frosh! And then the barracks... And then the barracks the day after we crossed the Dnieper came back to me. Hot water and a foolish-looking fellow of angelic goodwill. What was the stabs going to pin on him? In the third row of men, some ten or twelve yards from me, Frosch was standing in attention while abuse rained down on him. He was staring straight ahead, as required by convention. His gaunt, hollow face was partly hidden by his heavy steel helmet. Unfortunately, his stupidity was obvious enough to give the stabs a sudden sense of confident superiority over this soldier, who had clearly seen a lot. Two large hands, red with chill blains, emerged from his ragged sleeves to press for warmth against the folds of filthy cloth. The coat no longer had any buttons. Frosch had fastened it at each buttonhole with a short piece of wire. Which a touch, with a touching sense of aesthetics, he had, been bent, he had bent in the ends of each wire as if to demonstrate his good intentions. Unfortunately, he had linked a lower buttonhole to a higher one, which produced an improper and all too visible crease. This anomaly leapt to the eye of the inspecting non-com, who couldn't let such a golden opportunity slip. However, in complete disregard of normal practice, the company officer intervened, reminding the stops felt fable that our detachment had just survived an extremely difficult experience. 
Your supply report specifically stated that you possess the necessary materials for keeping your clothes in good repair. Herr Lieutenant, and specifically mentioned buttons. The lieutenant didn't know how to answer. In addition, Herr Lieutenant, Gefreiter Frosch hasn't even bothered to line up the buttonholes correctly. There was a moment of charged silence. The lieutenant threw Frosch a look of despairing compassion. Couldn't he have spared himself all this and deprived the instructor of this ludicrous opening? But the facts were as they were, and the lieutenant, despite all his goodwill, couldn't alter them. He resumed his former position with an impassive air. A wave of irritation seemed to run through the company. Stilgestan! The felt shouted. In a flood of gratuitous invective, Frosch was given 20 days detention and a series of punitive fatigues. Without flinching, Frosch left his position to the stand in the ranks of the guilty. He was the only one. The inspection was over. Quarter turn, left, left. Our companies went on to march around the camp. Frosch remained where he was, staring straight ahead. As the only man to be punished, he seemed a symbol of injustice, alone in his punishment as he had always been in life. He had found some comradeship in the Fairmacht, but the exig exigencies of military life exacted a high price. Ten days later, when the rest of the unit drew new clothes, Frosch kept his rags. He had in truth become a symbol. He didn't know how to hate, an always worse expression of touching stupidity and banal goodwill. Later, the veteran said of him, He's as humble as Diogenes. If he doesn't deserve victory, at least he deserves paradise. Section forward, on the ground, on your feet, run, forward, on the ground, on your feet, facing me. The hard, frozen ground scraped our hands and knees, and the sharp twigs of leafless scrub finished off our threadbare uniforms. They had put us through a series of exercises with concussion bombs. We, who had faced the fire of Russian katushas, just laughed. Then we made ourselves as flat as the Ukrainian soil. Now we lay propped on one elbow, half amused, half exasperated. Our attitude provoked torrents of abuse and a collective punishment for the whole company. We had to crawl along the entire perimeter of the camp. The ground, three or four inches beneath our eyes, soaked up the muttered curse of our progress. The instructor non-coms were working hard, running along the carpet of soldiers. A short way off, Feisreidau was watching this bad joke and arguing with the officer responsible for the camp. But he might as well have saved his breath. Orders from higher up had put an end to the coddling of troops just back from the front. We had to reinstate the rigidity of 1940 and 41 and wage war to the death. We went on long marches, carrying all our gear... We tramped through villages and steppes, singing. These demonstrations were intended to impress the local population, who in fact greeted us as we went by, the boys waving and the girls smiling. The routine never let up. We even had to practice retreating in a series of backward leaps, a skill which might always come in handy. Every fourth day, we were free from 5 to 10 p.m. We flooded into Nova Torechi, in Suica, two villages near the camp, where the peasants often invited us in their houses and gave us something to drink and sometimes even to eat. Our, our soldiers quickly amused themselves with the girls, who were not shy. These few hours of liberty used to the, used to the utmost made us forget the rest. The following day, we would return to the training routine. Despite the boredom, we cooperated, thinking that perhaps these were necessary measures. We were still inclined to believe in the validity of orders. Perhaps these exercises would help us bring the war to a quicker end. At last, we were issued new clothes. Some of the uniforms were quite different from the ones we'd always known, with blouses like those worn in the French army today, and trousers tucked into short, thick spats, looking like a grotesque parody of a golfing costume. This new design was, for the most part, distributed to new troops. The Gross Deutschland, as an elite division, kept the old design. We were even given new boots, a further sign of privilege. 
However, the cloth of the uniforms was of very inferior quality, much more brittle than formerly. It reminded us of specially treated cardboard. The new boots were also markedly inferior, of rough, stiff, fourth quality leather, which cracked at the ankle instead of forming the usual crease. The underclothes were the worst of all. They were made of cloth which seemed to have substance only where it was doubled at the hem and seams. The new socks, which we appreciated immensely, also seemed curiously synthetic. If this is what we're getting, Hal said, I'll keep my Russian socks. In fact, the new socks were a great deal longer than the old ones. However, they were less warm. They were among the first to be made with nylon, which was largely unknown. We slapped a great deal of black polish from the store onto the boots to make them lose their look of cardboard paste. We all felt better to be out of our stinking tattered rags and in new clothes, despite the synthetic fabrics. Our brightened appearance also had an effect on the local inhabitants who decided that all must be well with the Fairmont. Hulls, in his fresh and dashing uniform, had fallen in love once more this time with a pretty young Polish girl. With him, falling in love was compulsive. He really couldn't help himself and lost a piece of his heart every time we stopped in a rest zone. This time, as always, he was ardently wooing a girl during our short periods of free time and we all had to hear about it constantly. You're driving us all up the wall with your tart, Lentz complained. Why can't you just kiss and run like everybody else? Lindbergh grinned. He was remembering his last outing with Lenson, Pfefferham, and Solma. The four had trapped a Polish woman of about 40 in a barn. She had yielded to their ardor, which had lasted the four hours remaining. Her husband came home while we were at it, Solma remembered joyfully. He laughed with us and said, Mama, too old for me now, for you. Later, they'd all had a drink with the husband, who seemed perfectly content that they'd done him that service. She's nothing but a sow, your Polska, Hal said, and you're just a bunch of pigs. No poetry at all. The barracks shook with our laughter. Pastor Pfefferham laughed too because he couldn't do anything else, but all the same, he was somewhat troubled. Our company's love life was doing far too well. I myself didn't have any particular adventures. I pawed one or two girls, but matters had never progressed any further than that. Of course, I was in love with Paul and wrote to her often. Above all, I longed for a leave and lived on that hope. For the rest, strange bodies made me uneasy, almost sick. As soon as I saw naked flesh, I braced myself for a torrent of entrails, remembering countless wartime scenes with smoking, stinking corpses pouring out their vitals. All things considered, I preferred platonic love by mail. To me, Paula was in an entirely separate category from all these other women. Something delicate and marvelous which could not be eviscerated. Or so I tried to think. Then I was involved in an episode which gave everyone else a laugh at my expense. We were on leave at Suica. It was a beautiful day with only a light trace of frost. We all felt like a spree but were also extremely interested in food. Our rations were now so small that we were always hungry when we left the mess halls. The peasants would usually sell us something to eat in exchange for the paper currency, which looked as though the rented bank was printing notes in excess of its reserves. We had, in fact, been given these notes as supplementary pay in addition to the special tickets issued to occupation troops. Eggs were the easiest form of food to come by. At Sueca, we divided the job. There were three of us, Hoth, Schlesser, and me. We had left Halls with his Polska at Nevatoreci. Nevatoreci was right beside the camp, and the soldiers had already stripped it of all extra food. We decided to go three miles further to Sueca, which was also on the Dnester. Taking separate routes through the countryside to try our luck at the farmhouses, whose location every man in the company had by heart. I set off along a road which ran downhill between two walls of snow. I can still see it. At the bottom of the hill there was a frozen pond and pink and yellow ducks were tapping with their bills, apparently mystified by its solidity. 
On the turn to the right, ahead of me were two low columns twined around with what looked like lifeless Virginia creeper, and beyond them an enormous pile of wood which almost hid the low thatched house. To the left, with their backs to the river, was a group of squat, irregular buildings made of rough wooden planks. The whole scene was inescapably rustic. There also was a rudimentary sense of style, which was noticeable here, even in the poorest, roughest setting. I was walking toward the cottage when I saw a woman coming from one of the outbuildings. Her clothes might have belonged to a medieval peasant. We both smiled. She said something unintelligible. Guten Tag, Frau. I Bita. I wasn't sure she wouldn't understand French, but she might very well know uh, the German for egg. Hi, I Bita. She came closer, still smiling and pleasant, speaking and making gestures I couldn't understand. I, cont- I contented myself with returning her smile. She signaled that I should follow her, which I did. We walked over to a ladder and she began to climb, signing me to hold it steady. As she went up, laughing and talking, my eyes naturally followed her ascent toward a loft bulging with hay. My astonished gaze struck her rump, which was of very dubious charm, and a pair of enormous meaty thighs. Her buttocks seemed to fill the view with a curious obstinacy. Her drawers had the texture of loosely knit sweater. I stared at them as I might have stared at some muddy medieval monument in the 12th century. The Polska, who saw that I was watching, finally stopped by the false window of the loft and waved at me to follow her. I felt awkward and uneasy. I had often watched a tank trying to outmaneuver a machine gun, but this type of maneuver was beyond me. I was used to going straight ahead, climb the ladder as if it were an assault wall, which I'd scale under the eye of an officer. Then I was bent double up in the pile, pile of hay beside the Polska, whose thighs must have been a half yard round. She was laughing, clucking as if she herself were about to lay an egg. My gun caught on everything, and I felt once again as if I were crawling down a trench. The hay was full of chickens. The Polska chased them off and collected a few eggs. She turned back to me, still laughing. Her teeth were some, somewhat too wide spaced, but they were dazzling white. She came toward me, holding out the warm eggs, which, in a manner of speaking, she had collected from me. I felt her breath and the warmth of her body as she thrust the eggs in her hands deep into the pockets of my tunic, her fingers pressed against my hips. My startled eyes rolled in my head and I waited for the order to disengage. But the order didn't come, and the bold fingers of the enemy kneaded my flesh through the double folds of my pockets. For the love of God, danke schön, danke schön, I wanted to make the possible quickest possible departure no matter what she thought of me she would she now seemed so close and embrace seemed inescapable her smile was one of certain anticipation and her eyes were rolling feverishly my god i braced myself for her cry of ura povieda there were two possible courses of action as i saw it i could withdraw in a hurry and risk cracking my skull at the bottom of the ladder or counterattack, rolling my adversary in the hay However, these calculations came too late. The woman, who must have weighed at least 20 pounds more than I did, suddenly enlaced me, adroitly pushed me to the left, so I lost my balance. I found myself gesticulating in vain, des- in vain desperation beneath a massive enemy. One of her hands was already busy with the fly of my new synthetic trousers. The eggs in both pockets were broken, and my gun, which was slung behind my back, was no use to me. If the Fuhrer ever saw me like that, I'd be thrown out of the Groß Deutschland for good. Shipped off to one of the Brandenburg disciplinary battalions. To complete my downfall, my ravisher, who was clearly more accustomed to manipulating an axe handle than the personal appendage in question, had grabbed me and was making me jerk and shudder like an invalid with a severe case of hiccups. I might perhaps have been able to oblige her if the Polska, in the height of her friendlies, had suddenly flung up her petticoats over the obese folds of her stomach and thighs. This spectacle destroyed the minimal desire my predicament might have roused in me, and the delicious memory of Paula offered a contrast which was too absurd. 
With a brusque twist of my body, I freed myself from this female in rut who was exciting herself without any cooperation from me. Her somewhat porcine face, in which a few moments before I might have found a certain charm, now wore an expression of bovine ecstasy. I stood up and turned out my pockets, which were filled with liquidated and broken shell. My companion regained some measure of self-control and tried to laugh, suddenly afraid that her audacity might provoke severe consequences. In a flash, I was at the bottom of the ladder, gesturing to the woman to bring me something to clean off my jacket. I myself was worried about the consequences of stains on my uniform that bright bring down on me. I tried to look furious, but an overpowering sense of inadequacy filled me flushed hotly instead. The Polska, half smiling, half uneasy, led me over to the house. We went through a door which opened outwards, down a few steps, then through a second door which opened inward. The house was built into the ground to a depth of about two and a half feet. We came into a dark, low-ceilinged room with a single tiny window, whose yellowish panes admitted very little light. The building was divided by a heavy wooden grate. One side was for people, the other for animals. This explained the fetid smell, which I noticed as soon as the door was open. A couple of pigs were being fattened just beyond the grate. The wide benches built into the grate and covered with straw ticks were obviously the beds. An old woman turned toward us as we came in. She smiled with the indifference of a sphinx. I doubt if the idea of a German even existed for her. Two children were playing on a woodpile which stood in the middle of the room. The Polska brought me some water and a wooden dipper, like the ones used in Russia for measuring millet. I had to take off my tunic and really reveal the extent of my deprivation. deprivation. The pullover my mother had sent me over a year and a half before no longer had any sleeves below the L.O., and the waistband became a scant lace-like fringe. I was preparing to wash the tunic when the Polska took it from me. She rubbed the stains between a round stone and stiff straw implement like a large cork. With a graciousness which almost excused her excesses of a few minutes early, she returned my tunic, which was clean once more. I didn't dare smile lest I rekindle her amorous fury. However, all of that seemed to be forgotten. These Polish peasants seemed curiously primitive, living wholly in the present, unburdened by any thoughts of the past or the future. I said goodbye, thrusting out my stiffened arm in a regulation salute.